Colossians chapter 2. This chapter of Colossians is, I believe, the reason that Paul wrote this letter. Um, it's what he wanted to say to the Colossian people. And we have been uh, studying this as the seventh message in our series on Colossians. And uh, the opening chapter is very just uh, glorifying Christ. It's pointing Him out as the supreme desire of our hearts and the um, supreme being in our lives. And we desperately need our perspective adjusted on that. Paul is going to go further in this chapter and tell us, like I said, his primary reason for this letter. And I'm going to read down through verse uh, 7, and then I want to uh, point out some features of this passage here. It says, For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be comforted, being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the Spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your love or your faith in Christ. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith as you've been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving." Let's ask the Lord to bless our time here. Lord, we come to you desperately needing your spirit to unveil our eyes and show us, Lord, what you have said in this passage. Pray that your spirit would do a work in our hearts tonight. Lord, that you would use uh, me to explain, Lord, what you've showed me uh, from this passage. And I pray that you would uh, just change the way that we think once again from our time in your word and uh, we thank you for your word and for the power of your Holy Spirit, for his presence even here among us tonight. And as we read the words, Lord, that you breathed out so long ago, Lord, may they breathe into our souls the grace that we desperately need in this day. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to notice some things about this passage. Paul leaves us in no doubt as to what he wants us to know. See verse 1. I want you to know something. What does he want us to know? Well, he wants us to know about his conflict. We think of conflict and we think fight, but don't think fight here. Think of what the original language says about this word. This word is agonizomai, agonizo in the Greek, which sounds like agony. We get our word agony from that. Paul has an agony for these people. He's agonizing about something. Hence the title tonight, Agony Over Something. And uh, the agony is over treasure. We'll get to what that means in just a minute. But verses 1 through 3 describe this agony and the burdens that it contains. 1 through 3, I believe, looking through here quickly, is, yes, one sentence. And there's lots of ofs and thats and... Um, phrases that sort of link up and it's all connected. It's sort of a huge funnel that we'll look at. In verse 4, Paul explains why he just told them about this agony. See verse 4, now this I say. I just said what I said because I don't want anyone to deceive you with persuasive words. So he tells you what he wants you to know, then he tells you why he wants you to know that. Okay, and in verse, uh, in spite of this agony, verse 4 now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. Verse 5, for though I am absent in the flesh, yet I'm with you in spirit. I'm rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. He's excited about something. Something brings him joy about these people, even though he's in agony over them. You can be in agony and yet joyful at the same time. Verses 6 and 7, Paul is going to give them the critical instructions, and really you could argue that this is the center of the book of Colossians here. They're at least one of the huge points of the book of Colossians, verse 6 and 7. As you've received Christ Jesus the Lord, you need to walk in Him. 
rooted and built up and established in the faith as, you, as you've been taught. And he is in agony for these people that they would continue in Jesus Christ. And notice verse 3, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He's saying everything that you desire, everything that you treasure, that you should treasure is found in Jesus Christ. And Paul, if you would if you would understand it this way, Paul is in agony over treasure. He's in agony that these people would treasure Christ as they should, as they really, as Christ is worthy of being treasured. It's like this. Uh, how many of you growing up have played the your colder or warmer game based on somebody there? You're trying to tell them where something is, okay? And let's say that something is right here in the pulpit and I'm over here and what are you saying? You're getting... Colder, colder, and I keep going and people start getting snarky about it. You're ice cold, you're frostbitten, you're absolutely on the south pole, you know, you're cold, cold. Oh, now, now we're getting hotter and we get hotter, hotter, blazing hot, burning hot, catching on fire. Oh, you know, if you're any hotter, you're the surface of the sun and you just, we have fun with this type of thing. Red hot, you know, freezing cold, that type of thing. And we're trying to guide that person and the closer they get, you know, the, the very little step that they take, if they take a step, no, 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 burning, burning, you know, we get closer and closer and it gets more exciting and more exciting. That is a low-grade form of agony. <laughs> okay? Do you agree? We're sort of agonizing with that person. Would you, it's right there, you almost touch, you can touch, you just need to look, look right here. And we're trying to micromanage their very actions and trying to, Get them to see what it is we're, try we're leading them to. That is a low-grade form of agony like Paul had for these people. And he's saying, there is treasure here. There's treasure underneath you. And you're, you're if you will, you're red hot. You, you don't need to look anywhere else. You don't need to go anywhere. If there were literally, you know treasure underneath someone we're trying to guide them to it we're trying to dig 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 and they're digging oh, i don't see any treasure there's nothing here i've gone down a foot what will you tell them if you know the treasure's there keep digging dig dig harder you know dig more and paul is saying to them you guys don't need your don't get up don't go anywhere you take a step away no 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 you're getting colder you're getting colder he wants them he's agonizing over these people and they're Ability to treasure what he treasures. And this passage is going to teach that the greatest defense against drifting spiritually is discovering the treasure of Christ. I am sick and tired, and you are sick and tired of seeing a pastor fall away from the faith. A popular blogger fall away from the faith. Doesn't believe in Jesus anymore. Um, these are people that wouldn't necessarily come to church here, but we've appreciated some of their works. I'm, I could name names. I don't feel like that's necessary tonight. But I, we could talk about people that have fallen away from the faith. Some people that even that you know have fallen away from the faith. And nobody wakes up. I said this in Sunday school this morning. It's crazy how all this sort of dovetails together. Um, nobody wakes up and says, you know, I'm tired of being a theist. I'm into atheism now. You know, this is atheist day. I'm going to be an atheist today and see how it works out. Nobody wakes up and does that. It happens gradually. It is a drift. And it's a disgusting drift. It's a terrible drift. It's something that ought to be preached against. And it is preached against here. But what is the secret to not drifting? The secret to not drifting, according to Paul in this passage, is treasure Jesus Christ. There's no reason to go anywhere. You're standing on top of treasure. And the secret to treasuring Christ, if you want to know what the secret to treasuring Christ is, it's continuing daily in the gospel. Verse 6 and 7, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him, rooted, built up in Him, established in the faith, as you've been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Just keep digging. Just keep digging. And as you dig, you will find gem after gem after gem after treasure after priceless treasure in Jesus Christ. 
agony over treasure. Let's see, first of all, in this passage, Paul's agony for these people. Paul's agony. Paul wanted these people to know about his agony for them. Verse 1, For I wanted you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea. I want you to know about it. It's definitely the point of what he's saying. This is what I want to say. This is what I want you to know, he's saying. It underscores the importance of whatever Paul is going to tell them. This is what he's agonizing for. I want you to know about it. We can also say it came from Christ working in him. Where do you get that? Well, if you go up to chapter 1 again, verse 29, we think of chapters as the great divide, you know, crossing the Cedar River, practically. You know, we're back in chapter 1. I mean, but that's not the way it was when Paul wrote this letter. He didn't say chapter 2. He just kept going. And it's, it's only a few, uh, it's only a verse away. I want you to know what a great agony I have for you. And if you look in verse 29, the very previous verse, you'll see he says, To this end I also labor, striving. You know what striving is? It's the same word for agony. I'm agonizing according to his working, which works in me mightily. And I want you to know what a great agony I have for you. So you see, he's, sell, he's telling them where this agony is coming from. It comes from Christ who's working in me mightily. He's agonizing according to Christ's working with him. What do you conclude based on that about Paul's agony? We could also say it was also, I'm, I don't think this is too far-fetched, is it? Paul's agonizing in accordance with Christ's working in him. So Paul's agony is also whose agony? Christ's agony. It's based on Christ's agony. Paul's agony for these people was Christ's agony for these people. It was those people who Paul had not met yet as well. Think of this. Notice how many times he points this out. I want you to know what great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Notice also in verse 5, he says, for though I'm absent in the flesh, he's very aware of that. I can't be with you. I can't be with you. I'm sorry I can't be with you. I'm not with you in the flesh. But he says, I'm with you in spirit, and this is my agony for you. This is what I want you to get a hold of. So it's for these people that he's not met yet. Raise your hand if you've never met the Apostle Paul before. Okay, so if Paul were alive today, he would be agonizing for all of you who just raised your hands as well. This was something that consumed Paul for believers. It was for those who he hadn't met. And the substance of this agony is found in the next verse, verse 2, that their hearts may be encouraged. This process, this statement of Paul's agony is this huge funnel. Okay? And we're on the outside of the funnel. If you think of funnels, you know, the stuff that you pour stuff into your car with or those cool things at the malls or the stores that you dump money in, and it goes down the funnel, okay? And it starts wide, and it gets smaller at the bottom. And this funnel that Paul's dealing with here starts in verse 2, that their hearts may be encouraged. Paul wanted new believers' hearts to be encouraged. The word here is comfort. It's the word that's used to describe the Spirit's ministry of comfort in John 15 and 16. Um, Go to John 15, 26. John 15, 26. Jesus is telling his disciples before he goes away from them. He's giving them some instructions. Verse 26, John chapter 15. But when the helper comes, we translate helper from a Greek word that means comforter. The comforter, the helper it's a word that means to come alongside of somebody and help them. If I see you have a heavy load or something, I come up and I grab part of that load. I get an end of it and I carry that load with you. I'm coming alongside of you and I'm in a sense comforting you. You don't think of it that way, but that's a, it's a helping that is involved here. The helper comes, whom I shall send to you, verse 26, from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me, and he also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. 
the Holy Spirit is coming, Jesus says, and he's going to testify of me. He'll testify of Christ. The Holy Spirit is the one who has a unique ministry of establishing us in the faith. The book of Romans, chapter 15, verse 13. I'll just read this for you. Romans 15, 13 says that now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God is able to fill us with all joy and peace and make us abound in this confident expectation through the ministry of this comforter. And Paul is saying to these people, I am so burdened, I'm so agonized for you that your hearts would be comforted. I want the Holy Spirit to come alongside of your heart and pick up the load. And I want Him to help you. I want Him to walk with you. I want Him to comfort you. This comfort, what will He do? Is He going to actually pick up something with us? Is He going to show us something? Is He going to tell us something? Paul gets more specific. If you're back in Colossians 2, he gets more specific for us. That their hearts may be comforted. Well, what do you mean, Paul? The next phrase, being knit together in love. It's, discovering, it's des- describing what comfort is talking about. How is God going to comfort your heart? Well, He's going to knit it together with other hearts in love. Those who know Christ are one body. And Paul, in el- other passages in Ephesians, he says that the body is knit together. It's knit. You think of knitting don't think I've ever knitted in my life. But if you knit something together, I know this, it's a form of tying it together. You can pull that uh, after you're done and you pull those things tight and it's, it's knit together. It's, those things are attached together. And our body, if you think of the way that your body is held together, you have tendons and ligaments and all of these things that hold your body together. And we are a spiritual body and we're knit together with other believers And what are the ligaments and tendons and things that hold us together? It's love. Knit together in love. And we function as a body. When a member is hurting, we all hurt because we're organically joined together. And Paul says, I want the Holy Spirit to comfort you and I want Him to tie you to other believers in love so that you can help one another in this process of treasuring Christ. And when one member is hurting, All the members hurt. And you've seen this happen many times over when you've smashed your thumb or something on your body. You know, you smash your thumb and you don't just think, well, thumb hurts. You know, we should do something about that. No, you're, when you're, when you really do a number on your thumb, your whole body responds. I mean, you, you start to curl up around your, as if this is going to help your thumb protect it from anything. You know, but you curl up around your, your face contorts and you start jumping up and down for some reason. Like that's, your legs are sympathizing with your thumb. I mean, the whole thing's going together and you're, you vocalize things. Oh, you know, and this is just, everything's in harmony and your, your abdominal muscles constrict. Your diaphragm goes into this rigid position. We could talk about all these things that your body, and you just hit your thumb. Your body is sympathizing together. And the Christian body, the body of Christ, is like that. And we're knit together. Paul says, I want you to be comforted by the Holy Spirit, knit together in love. Is that the way that we would describe the way that we interact with one another at all times? there's There's some application that we could get into here. We need to be knit together in love. And it happens. It has to be done by the Holy Spirit. It has to be the Holy Spirit that does this. But we have to cooperate with with Him. Sometimes the Holy Spirit is trying to knit us with someone and we will not be knit. (laughs) And we're resisting that. We need to cooperate with the Holy Spirit on this. And He says, being knit together in love, what's another facet of this encouragement? Being knit together in love and attaining to all Riches, attaining to all riches. There's some spiritual riches to be had here. And the spiritual riches consist of two things, full assurance and conviction. Full assurance, unto full assurance of understanding. The idea here, um, being 
fully assured of something. This is a divine convincing of something. The Holy Spirit, again, is comforting us. He's knitting us together in love, and He's convincing us of something. He's bearing witness to His Word and with our spirit that the things that we have placed our hope in are steadfast and solid. There's no need to waver on this. The Holy Spirit convinces us of this. We read the text of Scripture and the Holy Spirit says, that's so, that's right. He's, he's done that and there's a confidence that builds with that. We sold our, our uh, mobile home years ago back in 2014 or 15 or something like that. And I'd never sold anything that expensive before. And, and I was nervous because this guy was coming from Minnesota and he wanted to buy my trailer and said, I'll bring you a, a check. And I was like, well, make sure it's a cashier's check because I'm going to go verify the thing. And so he gave me a check and I was like, okay, now what do I do? So I called the bank of his check and I said, I have a cashier's check from your bank and I'm going to read you the serial number and you're going to tell me if this is a real check. And I read the lady the serial number and she said, yes, that's a real check from our bank. And I said, thank you. And then I called him back later and did the same thing over again. Because I was nervous. I did not want this check to bounce and him take my trailer. And so I called him back and she said, yes, that is a real check. And I think it was a different lady. Um, but my, you know, when I hung up the phone that second time, there was a peace in my heart that this is legitimate. This guy is not coming to steal my house. Um, he is... He is legitimate. And there was a level of assurance and confidence and a peace. And I got excited that, yeah, I'm gonna, this is actually going to happen. This is going to work. And that is a picture of what the Holy Spirit does in our hearts. He says, I want you to un attain to the riches of the full assurance of understanding, the full conviction, the full confidence of the spiritual condition. You say, I don't feel like we're there. We're not. We're like in the middle of the funnel right now. We say, he's going. So he is. Okay, it's going down to the bottom of the funnel. And he's going to keep going. So let's just follow him here. I want you to attain to the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God. To the knowledge of the mystery of God. We're getting closer now. We're, we've attained the spiritual riches, the source of the conviction and assurance of those spiritual riches, the riches of full assurance and understanding. What are we convinced of? What are we assured of? That we understand something. It's this understanding that produces a thorough spiritual knowledge. Understanding something can put your heart at ease. The full assurance of understanding. I skip, I, somehow I skipped that. The full assurance of understanding. We're assured because we understand something. And then we get to, to, the, to the knowledge of the mystery of God. The source of this, uh, the subject of the spiritual knowledge is the mystery of God that we discussed last week. So back up to the top. He says, I want you to be comforted, your heart knit together with other hearts in love so that you can help one another to treasure Christ. And I want you to be comforted in that way. And I want you to attain to the riches of the full assurance, the confidence of understanding something. Well, what are we going to understand? You're going to understand the knowledge of the mystery of God. And what is the mystery of God? The mystery of God is the mystery that we talked about last week. He says the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of who? And of Christ. The knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. Go back up to Colossians 1.27. We talked about this mystery last week. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is, what is the mystery? Christ in you, the hope of glory. And he says, I want you to know this mystery. I want you to be convinced of this mystery and utterly saturated in the knowledge of this mystery both of God and the Father, of God the Father and of Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And he says, that's what I want for you. I want you to be convinced and confident in that. And the end of this progression is that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in our Savior. Did, did you catch that? The, the funnel is going down, 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 down. 
and he says, I want you to be comforted, knit together in love unto the acknowledgement of the, of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. And once you get down here to the bottom, you got Jesus. You say, well, that, okay, so I got Jesus. Well, in Jesus are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Jesus, you have everything. So he's funneled us down to this one point, and he says, you need to treasure Jesus Christ because in Jesus is everything you could ever possibly want. In Jesus Christ is everything that we need. Having him, we have everything. That phrase, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, is one of the most powerful statements in Colossians. Let me just point this up for you. There is a thirst for wisdom today. Wisdom how to navigate these dark days in which we live. Everyone's looking to make good decisions about all kinds of things today. We could sit here and talk and debate and get into all kinds of approaches to uh, the coronavirus and the political situation in which we find ourselves and the future of this nation and and what we should do, and, and everyone is seeking, the world around us, America, is seeking wisdom. Uh, conspiracy theories abound. Uh, there are other theories that abound, and, and there is a search for wisdom. There's also a quest for spiritual knowledge. There are philosophies, and there are lectures that people go to. There are books that people read. Um, just talking with someone this week, there's a popular philosopher um, who has gotten a lot of acclaim, um, and he's going to be in Cedar Rapids in a little bit. He's going to be at the, the Paramount Theater. And, uh, you know, we were joking, let's go, you know. And, and uh, the conservative uh, philosopher, he's not a believer, though. And we, we're, ser- we're searching for these wisdom and knowledge and The world is searching for wisdom and knowledge, and all the while, it abounds in Jesus Christ. It's hidden in Jesus Christ. All of these things have abounded for centuries. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I'll have you turn there. 1 Corinthians 1, 22. Corinthians 1, 22. I'm going to start in verse 20 because I think it sets the context here. Where is the wise, Paul said. And the idea is, bring them forward. Calling all wise people in the room. Please stand up. Where's the wise? Where's the scribe? Are there any scribes here? Where's the disputer of this age? Let them come forward. Let them dispute. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through wisdom did not know God... It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Do you see what he's saying there? In in the wisdom of God, the world did not get to God through wisdom. You cannot get to God through erudite arguments and logic. You don't get to God that way. You get to God through the Spirit. Verse 22, For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. And the idea here is... They've done this forever. They'll continue to do this. And there, when the Greeks die, there'll be somebody else who takes up the, the cause. And they're seeking for wisdom. The Greeks seek after wisdom. Verse 23, But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. All of these treasures are hidden in Christ. You want wisdom? If you have Christ, you have wisdom. If you want knowledge, if you know Jesus, you know everything that you need to know. I feel like I'm not, I feel like this hasn't sunk in with us. I want to illustrate it this way. There's a story told of a, a uh, father and his son that were collectors of art. He covers this chest and he's looking around, make sure nobody's, nobody's, looking at this and and he he pops open this chest somehow and gets it open and it's full of gold. I mean, full of gold. And he covers the thing up. He shuts the lid and he pushes the thing down and he covers it up. He makes sure no one's around. And what does he do? He goes and he sells everything that he has. 
and he sells his house. How, do you, how crazy do you think the man looks? You're buying what? You're, you're selling, I mean, that's, that's a nice house. What are you, you're buying a field. Why are you buying a field? And they're scratching their heads, and the man goes and buys the field, and he knows that once the field is his, the treasure in the field is his as well, and he just increased his wealth by 100%. 200, 300%. He just made the investment of his life. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven's like that. You think you're getting something, but the longer you live, the more you realize you have in Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. What is this passage saying to us? It's saying that you need to search no further for wisdom and knowledge. If you will walk daily in Jesus Christ just as you received Him, you can forget the rest. If you'll walk daily in Jesus Christ just as you received Him, you can forget the rest. Everything you need is in Christ. You say, that sounds oversimplified. And I would submit that that's why we're in the condition we're in today. As the church of Jesus Christ, we say that's oversimplified. Yeah, maybe we think it is, but it's not. It's what Paul was saying. If you have Jesus, if you treasure Jesus above anything else, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all His righteousness, and what, what will happen? All these things will be added unto you. Jesus said that when you go up against people in persecution, people persecute you for your faith, you should say nothing, you should think about Nothing ahead of time. He says, therefore, in Luke 21, 14 and 15, therefore settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all of your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. Jesus is saying, you concentrate on your relationship with me. Don't worry about that. I will give you what you need to say. And they won't be able to resist it. And notice he doesn't say the Holy Spirit will give you. He says, I will give you. Now, it is the Holy Spirit within us. We know that. But it's interesting that Jesus points out, I will give you. Because in me are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So I want to, I want to make sure you understand this. In this day in which we live, where all kinds of crazy stuff abounds, we need to keep it simple. Okay? That's what we as Christians need to do in this day in which we live. Folks, if you get tied up with philosophy, and if you get tied up with the wisdom of this world, and being all interconnected with everything that's going on to the neglect of Jesus Christ within you, and you don't treasure Him, you're wasting your life, and you're wasting your opportunity to glorify God. We need to keep it simple. And it's not oversimplifying for Paul to say, in Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You want knowledge, you want wisdom, find Jesus. Treasure Jesus. That doesn't lead to passivity either. Okay, We, we're, we do this with our eyes wide open. We still wear our seat belts, okay? Somebody say amen to that. Okay, we still say, we still wear our seatbelts. We read our Bibles. Okay, we're not sitting there waiting for Jesus to tell us what to do tomorrow. We read our Bibles, we make decisions, we wear our seatbelt. God uses means to instruct us, but I'm saying that we get way too scatterbrained about this spiritually. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. If you found Jesus, folks, you found the treasure. You, you're, all, you're, you're red hot. You're getting colder. If you move away from Jesus, you get cold. If you stop treasuring Jesus, you get cold. And that is, that's Paul's agony for these people. He's in agony for these people because they're tempted by some of these people. Look at the next verse here, back in Colossians 2. He says, I say this, verse 4, lest anyone should deceive you with what? Persuasive words. Oh, how we love persuasive words. Did you hear that guy? Did you hear how he tore that guy up? Did you hear that? Did you hear? I cannot believe he said that. We love persuasive words. Persuasive words are based on perceived logical arguments. 
we like the way something sounds. God's given us this ability to discern logic, and that's not the enemy here. But we can get addicted to persuasive words. Persuasive words don't often stand the test of time and honest scrutiny. And it's almost like they're a kind of verbal magic show. Somebody, there are people out there that are skilled debaters. And you can go up against them and they will prove to you that you don't exist. And you will lose the debate hands down. The audience will vote against you. You do not exist, man. I mean, he just, I mean, he, he locked you up. You don't exist. And you're standing right there and you know you exist. <laughs> but he, he beat you in a debate. He proved this in a debate. And you know that you exist because you're sitting there staring at yourself. And I'm sort of overstating this to make a point. You know the type, they can argue with a fence post and win. Okay? And they are, they are just skilled at making sense. But folks, the truth sometimes is a paradox. And you have to sit and you have to think and you can't reduce it to a 30-second sound bite that gets tweeted 50,000 times. You can't reduce all of that to a 30-second sound. You can't reduce Scripture to a 30-second sound bite necessarily. It is spiritually discerned. And in our nation, in our world today, we are addicted to persuasive words. We're addicted. We're a sound bite society. We like persuasive words. But it's just a verbal magic show. These words are explained down in verse 8. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. We'll get into that uh, next time. I don't know how many of you have actually looked into some of the philosophies of this world, some of the philosophers the realm of apologetics is a fascinating realm. And uh, my brother got into that in high school, and certainly a lot to be said for that. There's some people that have really staked out the argumentation, giving a reasonable answer for our faith. I'm not against that, and they have to interact with some of these people. But that can lead into a fascination with philosophies and being able to outwit this guy being able to debunk this philosopher. And some of these waters, folks, are very deep. And some of these men are just outright skeptics. My brother was, went down that path in high school and decided he was going to take on some of these philosophers and started reading Nietzsche, some of these skeptics, atheists, who some of them died miserable deaths. But started reading them, and I'll never forget how he told me this. He said, I was, in a hard, I was working at, at this hardware store, and he said, I was so torn up in my mind. He said, I didn't know what I believed anymore. I, he said, I went and climbed on a shelf in the back of the hardware store, and I tried to figure out what I believed. That is where philosophy will take you. That is where the wisdom of this world, hear me, will take you. It will take you right to the hardware store on the shelf, not knowing what you believe. Because the answer is not in philosophy. You say, well, how do you know that? The Bible says so. The Bible says, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and, and empty deceit. It'll take you. It'll, it'll trash your faith. Be aware of that. Be on guard against that. And in the face of this danger, Paul says, I am concerned lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and vain deceit. But in, this, in the face of this, he still finds cause for rejoicing. Paul's joy in these people is in spite of his absence. He says, for though I'm absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit. I'm rejoicing to behold your order, the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Paul's joy, we've seen his agony, now we see his joy. It came from these Colossians' faith. They had an order to their faith. They had steadfastness to their faith. It's interesting, both of those terms are military terms. It's like an orderly formation. They're steadfast. They're not going anywhere. These believers had begun to experience the treasure of Christ, and it brought Paul joy. He says, I, I look at the order of your faith. I look at the steadfastness of your faith, 
and it makes me happy. I'm rejoicing to see that. But he knows that they had not yet known the vastness of these riches. He knows they don't understand it all yet. They're excited about it, but they don't understand it yet. It's like this. We're like, we're like this in this area, in this realm of technology. Imagine a person with a new iPhone going to look for a calculator in their house. I need a calculator. They got a, they got a phone in their pocket that will calculate just more than the calculator in their house by about 50 times. They're looking for a GPS. I need a GPS. I'm taking a trip. We got an iPhone. I, I know I need a GPS. Well, on your iPhone is a GPS that outdoes just about any GPS out there. I need a camera. Are you serious? You have an iPhone, you need a camera? Okay, on the back of the iPhone is a camera that does frontwards, backwards, sideways, virtual reality, all kinds of crazy stuff on, on this thing. What does that person need? They need to stop rooting around the house and play with their phone a little bit. Yes, I actually said that. They need, to, they need to sit and play with their phone. They need to figure out what is actually on their phone. Discover what your phone will do, and it will make you treasure your phone more. That's a weak illustration of what, I'm, what Paul is saying here. You need to learn to treasure Christ. You need to get to know Jesus more because you, you're looking for a calculator. You've got a graphing calculator on there. You're looking for a camera. You can take six hours of video in high definition on this thing. You have what you need. It's in your pocket. You have what you need, friend. It's in your heart. He's in your heart. In Him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So what do the Colossians need to do? What does this look like? Look at his instruction for them, finally. Paul's instruction, verse 6. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. First of all, consider who you received. Consider who you received. Who have they received, according to this verse? Verse 6. Christ Jesus the Lord. Jesus is Lord. They confessed that with their mouth. Romans 10, 9 through 13 says, If you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, Jesus is Lord. This is the substance of the Christian faith. Jesus is Lord of all. He's Lord of creation. He's Lord of redemption. He's at the center of redemption. You can't be redeemed without Jesus. He's Lord of redemption. Jesus is Lord. He's Lord of glory. He's Lord of the future. He's Lord of everything. Consider who you received at salvation. Who did you receive? Well, you received Jesus the Lord. You, conf you confessed Jesus as Lord. Consider who you received. Also consider how you received Him. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. Consider how you've received Him. What else did you do besides confessing Him as Lord? Romans 10 tells us. If you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, it says, and Believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. You believed in your heart. You received Christ. There was a faith that laid hold of Jesus Christ. In John 1.12, you probably have this memorized. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the children of God, the sons of God, even to them that believed on his name. When you believe on Christ, you identify yourself with Him and you get the right to become His child. It's like this. His death becomes yours. His life becomes yours. His resurrection becomes your resurrection. His past is my past. His, future, his present is my present. His future is my, pre, my, yeah, my future forever. And that is my identity. Identity is a powerful, powerful concept. It is what defines us. It's the roadmap we use today. We identify as so many different things. There are so many identities out there. There's the recovering alcoholic. I'm a recovering alcoholic. I'm a rageaholic. I'm a recovering rageaholic. Some people say, I'm a homosexual. That's my identity. I'm gay. I'm a single girl who, tr who struggles with depression. There are all kinds of identities out there. And I'm not here to comment on every single identity. I'm saying 
All of those identities are not the identity of a believer. Friends, you can be a Christian but, and, and you can still be a single person. You can still have struggles with substance abuse. You can still struggle with all kinds of things, but that doesn't have to identify you. That doesn't identify you to God. That's not your identity anymore. You're no longer a covering alcoholic, a rageaholic, a homosexual, a single girl who struggles with depression. You're now a child of God. That's your identity. As you've received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. Make that your identity. Let yourself, it goes on, rooted, verse 6, 7, rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith as you've been taught. Let yourself be rooted and built up in Jesus. You draw strength from the roots. You also draw weakness from your roots. So what are the roots of your life? Where does your life go down? And where does it take its sustenance from? What is your identity? I want you to think about that right now. What is your identity in your life? If you had to describe in just a few words yourself, what is your identity? That is where you get your sustenance. And you say, well, it's not good sustenance. Well, your, your identity is wrong. You're operating off of the wrong roadmap. You're operating out of the wrong root system. We need to preach the gospel to ourselves on a daily, weekly basis. That is what he's saying here. As you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in Him. That's your identity. You're a believer. You need to tell yourself tomorrow morning that. Because I guarantee you, you get up and you don't feel, you don't feel like a believer sometimes. You, you with me on that one? You don't feel right. You just feel nasty. And you've got to tell yourself. You've got to reorient yourself. As you've received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. Refuse to let anything else overtake the gospel in your identity. If you're struggling with a sin, that sin can creep its way into your identity. This is what I'm going to struggle with for the rest of my life. And it becomes me. It becomes who I am and it defines my life. That does not have to happen with a believer. The gospel can define you. I'm not just talking semantics here. I'm talking you can tell yourself this every day. You can orient yourself. You can root yourself in this, and it works. Paul's not just writing this to fill paper here. He's, he knows that this works. Let yourself be rooted and built up in Him. Let yourself be, the next phrase, established in the faith. This mirrors the steadfastness that Paul saw in the Colossians already. No matter the strength of your faith, there's always another level of strength and steadfastness to gain. Established in the faith, not going anywhere. And it says, abounding in it with what? Thanksgiving. That is a deadly, deadly weapon against apathy. Thanksgiving. If you're a thankful person, there is a defense against apathy, against drifting, because you're thankful to God. If you're a thankful spouse, your marriage is healthy because there's a gratitude there. If you're a thankful friend, your friendship is healthy because there's a gratitude there and there's a defense against drifting, against apathy. Thankful Christians are thriving Christians. And if you were to think about the progression in Romans 1, you would note at the beginning of that progression that ends in all kinds of debauched sins. He says, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful. They weren't thankful. Their gratitude died, and they began this downward progression into atheism and idolatry. So continue to walk in Christ by faith. As you've received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. So Paul's in agony. What's he in agony about? He wants these people to be comforted. He wants them to be comforted and that the Holy Spirit would knit their hearts with one another, that they would be completely assured and attain to this rich, these riches of the full assurance of understanding. He wants them to be assured of what God has told them. And what has God told them? God has told them that Christ is in you and He's the expectation of glory. 
Folks, if we could be assured of that this week, we would be rich, rich people. Spiritually rich. Paul says, when you understand that, there is a, there is a thriving that occurs. You have Jesus, and in Jesus are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. What are you searching for tonight? We're all at some point in our spiritual life, we're, we're all at varying degrees of our walk with the Lord. What are you searching for? What is the desire of your heart tonight? I can promise you based on this passage that whatever the desire of your heart is, you'll find it in Jesus Christ. If it's, if it's a legitimate desire, then you'll find it in Jesus Christ. You'll find it in Him. You don't need to go anywhere. You don't need to search anywhere else. In Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All that we need is hidden in Christ. We need to look nowhere else. Choosing to look elsewhere has disastrous consequences. I want to show you some pictures here of a B-24 Liberator that went missing on her first combat mission in 1943, World War II. Her name is the Lady Be Good. She was returning home from the Mediterranean, across the Mediterranean from Naples, Italy. She was on a bombing run. That's her crew there. She was supposed to land on the coast of Libya. And they arrived earlier than expected over the base, and the pilot watched his little... Uh, indicator turn the opposite way indicating that they had passed their destination and he radioed the base and said something's wrong here with my instrument can you give me a position and somehow they still mistook something and he didn't trust his instruments and he flew a thousand miles deep into the Libyan desert the plane ran out of fuel the crew parachuted out of the plane but every single person on that plane died in the desert. They were not found until 1958. That's how far out of the way they were. You know why they died? They didn't follow their instruments. They were right over top of, they probably flew over their base on their way to their, to their death. They were safe, but they flew over the base because they didn't pay attention to the instruments. They didn't trust the instruments. And folks, what this passage is telling you telling me is you're over the base. Obey your instruments. Don't keep flying. Land. Treasure Jesus Christ. You're on top of the treasure. You're red hot. Just keep digging. Well, how do I keep digging? Well, glad you asked. Receive, as you've received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. Folks, you do that, you'll begin to discover the treasure in Jesus Christ. And if you're not discovering the treasure in Jesus Christ, there's a chance that you're not walking in Jesus Christ as you've received Him. When's the last time you preached the gospel to yourself? When's the last time you reoriented your identity around Jesus Christ in the gospel? If you say, well, that's just sort of oversimplifying, God help you, you're flying over the base. And the directional indicator is flipping around and it's saying it's more sophisticated these days. You've got GPS, you've got everything, and it's saying blink, 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 stop, stop, turn around, land. Your conscience is going crazy. Folks, it's going crazy because we need to land. We need to treasure Jesus Christ. We're not, I, I can promise you, we're not going to find anything else that will satisfy. May God help us to treasure Him by walking in Him just as we received Him. Let's pray. Lord, we come to You because a sermon like this does absolutely no good without the power of your Holy Spirit convicting hearts. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters. Lord, we, all of us, struggle with these truths. We constantly stray from Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to realize that he who takes the Son gets all. That in your Son, Jesus Christ, in you, Christ, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Lord, we Desperately need to understand that better. Help us to walk in you as we've received you this week.
Lord, I pray for myself, Lord, that there would be adjustments made in my life, that I would be identified in your gospel on a more consistent basis. Pray that you would do eternal work in here tonight as a result of this. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like us to turn in the back of our hymnals to the song, Your Beauty Fills Our Eyes. As we look to Christ, we're changed and we begin to treasure Him more and more and more. Let's stand together as we sing, Your Beauty Fills Our Eyes. We have looked in faith to Christ, beholding God's atoning Lamb. He for our sins was sacrificed. Thus we, though dead, have been born again. Jesus, your beauty fills our eyes. First looking, we were justified. Now gazing deeper sanctifies Till face to face we are glorified Trust that you'll continue to meditate on that truth throughout this week. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Lord, go with us now as we go to our homes and pray that we would just live in victory this week. In Jesus' name.